Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, this morning, um, actually, let me introduce myself. Some of you don't know who I am. I'm Pastor Josh. I'm the pastor of prayer and family here at The Crossing, and I'm really, really super thankful uh, that we get to be here, that you have decided to, to fellowship and to worship with us. We're in the book of Acts this morning. So go ahead and start turning to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 26. And there is an awful lot uh, that Zech and I are going to be trying to cover. In fact, the entire chapter. But there's a lot here. So before we dive in, and I'm going to be diving right into the deep end of the pool. um, But go ahead and whatever you take your, whatever you read your Bible on. This morning, your Bible, your tablet, your phone. Go ahead and hold that up and we're going to read this together. But before we read it, I I just want to... Let's slow down. I was, I was, the other two services, I found that I was reading this really, really fast. And I want to slow this down because I want us to really think about what we're saying, all right? So let's read this together. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. In this book are the keys to an abundant life, a joy-filled life, and eternal life. I will take God at his word. Amen. That's where we begin and end with God's word. Isn't it awesome? Isn't it an amazing thing that we have the very words of God? His mind, his heart that he breathed out that we can hold and that we can know. We can know the mind of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? I'm super excited. So we're at, like I said, we're in Acts chapter 26. And in Acts chapter 26, we see the great missionary, the Apostle Paul, appearing before a Roman governor and a Jewish king. Uh, The Roman governor, that is Festus, and the Jewish king is King Agrippa. Now, wait a second. How did that happen? How did Paul, the great missionary, all of a sudden appear before a Roman governor and a Jewish king? Well, in order to answer that, I'm just going to back up just a little bit and give a little bit of a review. So we're going to go all the way back to chapter, Acts chapter 21. And in Acts chapter 21, we see Paul, and he is in Jerusalem at the temple. But there around him, there's a couple of people people. Uh, may, maybe only a few, I don't know, but there were some people that started to spread lies, rumors about him. And all of a sudden, you've got this group of people, and they're starting to shout and scream their lies. And before long, you've got this group who are, they are inciting a riot. And that riot, then they've got a big mob of people, and they start attacking Paul. They actually go and they're starting to beat him. And in fact, they, it says that they're taking him over to the side and they're going to kill Paul. That's what they were trying to do. And I love God's provision. Uh, in God's providence, I don't know, I think it's a little bit funny, but in God's providence, he said, okay, I'm going to rescue Paul, but I'm going to rescue him using a Roman military commander. And he sees Paul and he goes over and he rescues him by arresting him. <laughs> That's kind of a little funny to me. But there, there Paul he is, is arrested by the Romans. And then from chapters 21 all the way to 26, those six chapters actually cover about two years of Paul's life. Two years of Paul being imprisoned, wrongfully so. But in those six six chapters, in those two years, we see all sorts of plots to kill Paul. Lots of people trying to kill and plotting to kill him. We also see some smooth-talking lawyers making ridiculous accusations against Paul. We see sham trials and sham investigations all against Paul. And we see a whole bunch of corrupt political leaders. Last week in chapter 25, we saw yet another trial, this time with Governor Festus, a governor who, by the way, we discovered actually didn't really care at all about truth. Because he could have investigated the truth. He could have gone and found people who knew about Paul, who knew about Jesus. But Festus didn't care about the truth. In fact, he was more concerned about his own power, maintaining power, giving and getting political favors. That's what he was more concerned with, even more concerned with that than knowing the truth. And it was in this trial that Paul finally said, you know what, I appeal to Caesar. I appeal to Caesar. You see, Paul said, I want to go, I, I, I don't, this, this trial is not going anywhere. I want to go to the head. I want to go to the top power. 
And that would be like, maybe if, if, if I was being accused of something, I could say, okay, you know what? I'm going to the top power in the entire land. I'm going to go to the president who also serves as like the Supreme Court judge, the top guy. That is who Caesar was. He was an emperor, but he also heard things, which, by the way, was the right of every single Roman citizen. And Paul was a Roman citizen. So he said, I appeal to Caesar. And Festus, when he heard Paul say, say that, he conferred with his counselors. He said, okay, Paul, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. But it was customary in those days for, for if, if, if you're going to send somebody to Caesar, that you don't send them without a, a report or a letter or something stating the charges. But as you, you and I know, Festus wasn't really interested in knowing the truth. And so he's kind of scratching his head, and he's like, well, i got to send Paul to Caesar, but I don't know what to say. Lo and behold, King Agrippa, a Jewish king, he comes, he shows up to visit Festus. And Festus and Agrippa, they're talking, and they're saying, hey, what should we do with this guy? And Agrippa says, I want to hear Paul for myself. And, and Festus says, tomorrow you're going to hear from Paul. And now we finally come to chapter 26. In verse 1, it says this. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. Now let's pause right there just for a second. Because I want to ask you a question. What are some different ways Paul could have defended himself? What are some different ways Paul could have defended himself? Now keep in mind, Paul has been in prison for the last two years in prison under false accusations by the Romans. In fact, some of the Romans thought he was an Egyptian terrorist leading a revolt. Others had accused Paul of starting riots and being a troublemaker and desecrating the temple. None of which, by the way, were true. Felix, the governor right before Festus, he kept Paul in prison. And all he, the only reason he was doing that was because he wanted to try to extract a, a bribe, some money from Paul. Paul had been harassed and beaten and almost killed by an angry mob. And then he was put in chains and thrown in prison. And that was the last two years of his life. So knowing what you know about Paul and the wrongs that were done against him, and now he's being given a chance to speak before a Jewish king and a Roman governor, how could Paul, like, what was he going to say? What was his defense going to be? He could have said, King Agrippa, this is not fair. I've been wrongly and unfairly held by corrupt Roman officials. You're a Jewish king. You got to do something to help me out. I've been wrongly accused. My accusers are lying. And it's not fair. I've done nothing wrong. Can you relate with Paul? I've done nothing wrong. Have you ever been wrongly accused of something? Maybe a friend thought the worst about you. Maybe you've been misunderstood and your motives were unfairly judged. Maybe you were blamed for something that you know that you never did. Maybe a friend, a spouse, a sibling, a co-worker, a boss said things about you which you knew were false. How did you defend yourself? Well, how did Paul defend himself? Well, in verse 2, we read Paul's opening statement, and it goes like this. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. Now, wait, wait a second. Did I read that right? Paul considers himself fortunate to stand before King Agrippa? Fortunate? You'd think that Paul would be so sick and tired of two years of investigations and sham trials. You'd think that Paul would be ready to complain. You'd think that he'd be ready to throw his accusers under the bus. But he considers himself fortunate? Why? Well, in verse 3, he explains a little. And he says, and especially so because you, King Agrippa, are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. You see, Paul knew who his audience was. King Agrippa. And King Agrippa was a Jewish king. And as a Jew, King Agrippa would have known not only a lot about the various controversies surrounding the different religious leaders, but more importantly, King Agrippa would have known about the hope 
that was written in the Old Testament. That hope, all the prophecies, all the promises that was pointing towards the coming Messiah. King Agrippa would have known about that. And he, he was, like all the Jews in those days, they were, they were looking forward to the, to the hope of the coming Messiah. And I, just a side note here. I want you all to know that every single prophecy that is about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament, they were all fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Amen. Isn't that good news? Now, it doesn't say this, but in my mind, I think Paul was also thrilled. I think he was also, when he said, I feel fortunate, I think he was also thrilled because as he looked around the room, he saw Jews and he saw Gentiles. And I imagine that he smiled as he remembered God's word about him, about what he was going to do. Back in Acts 9, 15, God said, Paul is, and God speaking about Paul, Paul is going to be my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And Paul's there in this, in this investigation room and he's looking around and he's like, oh, isn't it cool? God is fulfilling his word. I've got kings and Roman governors. So awesome. I love that. But, what is Paul's defense? So starting in verse 4 and going all the way to verse 23, Paul gave something which looked a little less like a personal defense and a little more like a personal testimony. You see, Paul then, for those verses, he shared his whole life story and how God had rescued him. That was his defense. He shared his life story to Agrippa and Festus and everyone there. Why? Because he wanted to share the gospel with Agrippa and with Festus. He wanted to tell them the good news. In essence, Paul was sharing his story because he wanted to say, look how God saved me. God can save me. He can save you too. That's what he was doing there. That's why he was there. That's why he was excited. And Paul turned this whole trial, this whole investigation on its head because he was less concerned about proving his accusers wrong and he was more concerned about simply sharing the gospel with those people who needed to hear it. You see, Paul's whole attitude was not one of defensiveness. Had he been wronged? Oh yeah, he had been wronged. Was he accused of doing things that he never did? Yeah, he was accused. Did he have the right to complain and whine? No, he didn't. Why? Because Paul knew ultimately the Lord is his defender and his job is to make the name of Jesus known. That's Paul's job. Not to defend himself, but to say, Jesus, I want to make your name known. What about us? How do we respond when we are wrongly accused? Do we blow up and get defensive? Do we start a litany of our own counter accusations? Do we start throwing others under the bus? Well, I might be wrong, but that person over there, they were more wrong. Or do we have the attitude that simply says, Lord, you are my defender. I'm going to trust you, Jesus. And by the way, I'm going to view this situation now as an opportunity to love people to Jesus. This morning, I want to leave you with a couple of questions. In your relationships, what would happen if you became less concerned with the desire to be right? What would happen if you were less concerned with not being wronged and more concerned with loving people enough to share the gospel with them? What if we were less concerned about if we had been mistreated and more concerned about making Jesus known? Let's make this a, a little bit more personal, right? <laughs> what about your closest relationships? What, what would happen in your marriage if you responded lovingly to your spouse for every harsh word, every criticism, every accusation leveled against you? What if you responded in love? What would happen if you did not care about winning an argument and instead you cared more about showing the love of Jesus? What if you did what Jesus did said to do in Matthew 5, 39 to, you know, turn, turn the other cheek. What if we did that? What if our main goal was not to provide an airtight defense of our motives and our actions, but rather to simply shine the love and light of Jesus to your spouse 
to your sibling, your friend, your boss, and yes, even your enemy. Church, there's a reason why the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Why does it say that? Because it works. And not just does it work, it's actually a place of deep blessing for the believer to live in where we say, you know what, I don't have to defend myself. God's going to do that. Lord, I just want to walk in an Ephesians 4, 2 kind of life. What does Ephesians 4, 2 say? say? It says, be completely humble. Be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's a place of great blessing. When we can pour out the love that God has poured upon us, pour that out to others. So my challenge for you this morning, church, is number one, to view every situation as an opportunity to shine the love of Jesus, even to people who might be mistreating you. Let the Lord defend you. Share your story. Share how God has rescued you. Share how God loves you and he wants to love them too. Because Jesus came to rescue, to seek and save the lost. And some of you have been sought and saved. And share that with those who mistreat you. Thank you, Pastor Josh. <clears throat> All right. Well, if you do not know who, uh, who I am, my name is Pastor Zach, and I am the youth pastor here. And, uh, man, I am learning as a, a new father that uh, it is hard to see seasons, like, change. And, man, I'm really sad to see some of my graduated seniors leaving, uh, just as Pastor Josh is. But then it also, like, made me think for a second, man, that countdown has started already for me where I'm, I'm going to have to say bye to my daughter sooner than I would like to. But, you know, the Lord's going to make the sun stand still. Anyway, that wasn't a part of my message, but I was reflecting heavy back there. I was like, Pastor Josh, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, I'm going to pick up where Pastor Josh left off, and we're going to start reading in verse 24, <clears throat> Acts 26, starting in verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. And we'll stop there. You are out of your mind. This was supposed to be an insult. Um, but I started to think about this. I started to kind of like chew on it a little bit. And as I started to think about it, I was like, man, there's actually probably nothing else I'd rather be told that I am when it pertains to Jesus or when it pertains to the gospel. Because if you really think about it, the ways of this world are so backwards, right? The ways of this world are so upside down when you compare it to God's original design for humanity. So many things that are completely wrong are being called right. Sin is something that is celebrated. Sin is something that is encouraged by the people in this world. You're going to make me do that. All right. I apologize about that. Sin is something that has been encouraged and, and celebrated in this world. For instance, I'm going to give you three promises that the world will tell you. That the world will tell you, and, and it directly contradicts what the Scripture says. Okay, so the world tells you this one. Follow your heart. The world says, follow your heart. But in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand you? So the world is telling you to trust something, to follow something that is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. The second example is that the world will tell you to do what makes you happy, to chase your dreams. But in Matthew 7, 12, it says, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. You see, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about us doing to others as we would have them do to us. It's about service to one another, 
Or how about in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make your path straight. It's not about you chasing your dreams. It's about you placing your trust in the Lord and then he will direct your steps. The third one is that the word will tell you that the world will tell you to find your truth or to be true to yourself. But we know the words of Jesus in John 14, 6. It says, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Sin has become something that is celebrated and even encouraged in this world. But can I encourage you? We're not just citizens of this crazy world. As children of God, we're first citizens of heaven. So when we live out according to our orders that come from heaven above, it's going to look a little bit crazy to this world. It's going to look like we're a little bit out of our minds. This reminds me of David when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to his people and he was dancing and leaping before the Lord out of worship. And he says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 22, he said, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes. You see, David abandoned his reputation to worship the Lord. He didn't care what he looked like to everybody else to praise him. He was a man after God's own heart. That's what the scripture tells us. He worshiped the Lord so intimately. He praised the Lord so boldly. Now, I'm not talking about us going out there and making fools out of ourselves and saying, hey, everybody, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm a Christian. I'm not, I'm not saying we should do that. But what I'm saying is, when we come into the house of the Lord, when we come into the presence of the living God to worship, would you become undignified? That's my daughter, everyone. I'm sorry. She liked that. <laughs> I'm sorry. When you, when you come into the house of the Lord, would you become undignified in his presence? When you open this Bible, the word of God, as Pastor Josh shared, that it is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And as Paul said, or in Acts, he said, your great learning has driven you insane. When you open this, when you study this, would you become insane for Jesus? When you begin to have those conversations with your coworkers and your unsaved family members and your classmates and your uh, teammates, would they describe you as out of your mind because of how passionately you follow after Jesus and how passionately you talk about him? One of my favorite musicians in all time, he's, he's kind of a deep cut, so you might not know who he is, but his name is Keith Green. Oh, a couple of you guys know he could play the piano like a beast. And one day, I will not. <laughs> anyway, he plays so well. My favorite musician of all time. But what he said is the very definition of a Christian is someone who is bananas for Jesus. Y'all heard that before. Are you bananas for Jesus? Because when you look at the pattern of your life, when you look, look at your thought processes, when you look at your study and the word and your worship, would you be able to describe yourself as bananas for Jesus? Guys, I know I'm talking a lot about being crazy and out of your mind, but it is true and it is not insane. It's up, it's not upside down, it's right side up. It's completely countercultural, yes. It's completely the opposite of the example that's been set before us by this world. But it is the way that you and I were designed to live. Completely sold out to Jesus and the work of the gospel. Let's go to verse 25, and let's, let's see how Paul responds to what was supposed to be an insult. You are out of your mind. Verse 25. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. What I am saying is true and reasonable you see, it's not insane. It actually makes sense. When we look at the totality 
of what God has done for us, and because it was done for us out of love, it actually makes sense. Now, I'm going to be careful and say this. I do not mean that I am any bit deserving of my salvation. None of us can even begin to deserve what Jesus did for us on the cross. But when you look at the very nature of God and why he created you and I, why he created us was so that he could love us and so that he could be loved by us, so that he could have relationship with us, to walk with us in the garden, in the cool of the day, as it's described in Genesis. That's a picture of how it was meant to be. And then sin got in the way of all of that. So God being perfect in every way and desiring to restore that relationship between us and him, sent his son down to pay the, to pay the price for our sins. It's true. And it's reasonable. As Pastor Josh shared, every single one of the uh, prophecies was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Amen? It's true and it's reasonable. And as Paul makes his defense and he begins to tell his testimony, he's really just telling about the heart of God and how Jesus saves. He's telling us about the hope. And he begins to narrow down the conversation down to the heart of it. And he begins to point his defense, which is Jesus, directly to King Agrippa. In verse 26, it says, the king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody where you're sharing your faith with them and they, they don't believe, but they tend to lean in a little bit to listen to what you're saying? It's because there's a God-shaped hole in their heart and there's something that's inside of them that is longing for the truth. There's something inside of them that is longing to be restored with their relationship with, the, with their father, whether they can put the words to it or not. And that's what Paul is doing with King Agrippa right here. He goes, do you believe I know you do. What is the heart behind all of this? Why would we live our lives in a way that's so countercultural, in a way that looks like we're all out of our minds to this world? What is the heart behind all of this? I believe we can find this in verse 28 and 29. It says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Guys, think about this for just a second. Pastor Josh shared this with us. The last two years, this dude has been wrongfully accused. This, this saint, this work, worker of the gospel has been beaten, has been wrongfully accused, has been imprisoned, has been mocked, has been tried several times, and you'd think you'd get frustrated. But he said, man, I want you to be what I am, except for these chains. I want you to be saved. I want you to be delivered. I want you to be set free. Forget these chains. Forget the physical. Forget the flesh. Let's talk about the spirit. That's what Paul's doing right there. That's why, that's what Paul devoted his whole life to. That's why this ministry of the crossing exists. That's why week after week after week, we consistently proclaim the gospel at every time that we open the ministry, uh, open the doors. We want every person that comes through those doors to hear the good news and to surrender their life to Jesus, to the hope of Christ that he has to offer. We desire that all who walk through that door become as we are, saved, set free, delivered, victorious in Jesus, forgiven, unashamed, equipped, sent, bought by the blood of the lamb. No, I don't think I can persuade you to become a Christian in such a short time, but Jesus can. No, I don't believe that I can persuade you to 
live your life in a way that looks like you're out of this mind according to the world. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. But I really hope it is a short time. The scripture says that today is the day of salvation. And if you have not heard the gospel, I would, I would love to share it with you just, just real quick. I began to share it a little bit earlier where I was talking about how you and I were created for the purpose of being loved by God and to love him and to have relationship with him. Man, can I tell you that God loves you so much, that Jesus loves you so much? In fact, that there is absolutely nothing that you could do that would make God love you more, and that there's nothing that you could do that would make God love you less. That's because that his love is unconditional. We can't earn it. We can't do anything for it. We can't lose it. His love is perfect in every way. But because he is perfect, he cannot be in the presence of sin. And we were born into that sin. No one taught us how to lie, but boy, we sure did pick up on it really quick. And out of his love, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to walk a perfect life, to walk among the world that he created with his very words. And he walked with, with us and it led him to the cross and he willingly laid down his life on the cross. And on the cross, he bore the weight of every sin, every shame, every sickness, every disease. He bore the weight of it all. He died that we may be set free. That's what Romans is talking about when it says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not should, not could, not would, but will. You will be saved if by faith you proclaim that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you would like to pray to receive Christ in your life for the first time this morning, or maybe you have invited him into your life, but you haven't dedicated your life to him, I would like to invite you to pray a prayer of faith with me to make that decision. I promise you it's the best decision you'll ever make with your life. All you need to do is ask him and he will do the rest. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you that it is living and active, Lord. Father, I thank you that you love me. Lord, I thank you that you love every person in this room enough to send your son, Jesus, to pay the price for my sin, God. I recognize, Lord, that I am nothing without your love and that my sin separates me from you. God, I just ask that you would forgive me of my sin. I repent from it. Jesus, I know you are Lord, but would you be Lord of my life? Would you come in and make me new again? My life is yours. In your name I pray. Amen.